to The Truth in This Art, your source for conversations at the intersection of arts, culture, and community. I am your host, Rob Lee, and I am excited to have you joining us today. My next guest, this is going to be a treat, my next guest is a Baltimore-based artist known for her passion for murals and large-scale work, where she creates art that transforms spaces with purpose and context. Please welcome Kate Kluswitz. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for spending some time um, with me uh, this afternoon. And, um, you know, one, you know, following your work for a bit on the IG and, you know, seeing it around the city a bit, you know, I definitely wanted to um, reach out and connect. I'm glad that we're doing this now. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, well, you know, because we chatted about it a little bit, but I had some major imposter syndrome when you first reached out to me. I was like, did he did he mean to send this to me? Is he sure? And <laughs> you know, you were, and I appreciated that. But I'm always very curious to know um how people find my work. And I'm assuming it's probably just because of the company that I keep. I know that you've interviewed a lot of my artist friends, but yeah. It's it's a bit of that and just, you know, sort of, you know, I do the the online thing and I always got my ear and eye to the street. So You're that's professional. Yeah. You know, <laughs> the, art, the art of noticing, I suppose. Right. Yeah. No. Well, it's very cool. I'm very excited to be here. A little bit of imposter syndrome that I'm shoving deep down. <laughs> I mean, I deal with it every episode. It's just like, am I good at this? <laughs> <laughs> you um, are. I can I'll just tell you, you are. You're good. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Um so, you know, as is the custom, uh, I like to give folks the opportunity to to introduce themselves in their own words. That's the, the one of the key things in this podcast, you know, of authenticity. Like, you know, we have these these different weighty things that are in these artist bios and online. And it's just like, I don't know if that's how I describe myself. So I like to lend that opportunity to the guests to come on. So if you could introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your work. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that is such a cool idea. And that is like the hardest thing ever to do, though. I find that the hardest thing ever to do. It's like that. It's hard to be objective about yourself. But um, I'll tell you the things I know. So I, I'm Kate. I've uh, I've uh, been in Baltimore for going on 14 years. Um, Baltimore has been at the 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 start of my artistic journey. So really, my my Kate K Designs was born here in Baltimore. So it is a Baltimore business. Um, I mostly do murals, um, although I am open to and often do other kinds of large scale art like window splashes and even sometimes chalkboards. But um, my my thing and what I really love to do is murals because I love to work with architecture and space and environment. It's great. It's great. And again, you know, like I've said, I've seen a few things, you know, like the Waverly Commons one comes to mind. I'm on your website right now. And I was like, I go through Waverly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was um that one I did with um an artist that I work with a whole bunch, uh Caroline Lampinen of OK Everything. That was a really fun one to do. Nice, nice. So you you said Baltimore for over a decade, you know, about about 14 years. So where where else have you you lived? Because I feel like you've you've moved around a bit. And obviously when when someone moves around, there are different experiences or different influence that kind of like show up. So could you speak on like some of the places that you you've lived and maybe some influences along the way that have maybe influenced your your take on how you approach projects? Yeah, absolutely. Um so I mean, I I could list for you all of the places that I've lived. Um, but so I, I was uh, not born in Germany, but we moved there when I was a baby and I lived there till I was around uh, five or six. So those are, you know, I was very young, but I often find that the... And I mean, it's when you're that age, everything is very sensory. So, right, like visual smells. Um, so even though I don't like, I don't have a lot of like cognitive memory of that place, it definitely kind of seems to fill the like very instinctive, like, I don't know, like my earliest memories are of, of you know, some of the things that I saw there. Um, and then let's see, we were in the back to the US then after that in a couple of different places, um, Pennsylvania, actually Maryland. Coincidentally, we lived down in Pasadena for just a couple of years. Had nothing to do with me coming back later in life, but that was kind of a weird little blast from the past moving back to Baltimore. Um, but then we lived in Australia for a really long time. And when we lived there, we moved there when I was uh, 12 and we lived there until I was 18 or 19. So at that point in my life, that had been the longest I'd ever been in one place at a time. Um, 
So that really felt like home. That was really hard to leave. But anyway, back to the U.S., Hawaii, and then New York City, and now Baltimore. Um, but in terms of how I feel like it has influenced my work, I feel like um, there's there's some ways that I feel like in a more cursory and sh and like I don't know in a more cursory way that I feel like it has influenced the like the style or the way that I paint and in and in that it's more little things like for example I was uh, approached by a German restaurant owner at one point to come and do some work in his restaurant didn't happen but I had some really cool ideas right off the bat right like the more diverse your experiences are the more you have to draw from and the more you know maybe ideas you get right off the bat um but I feel like beyond that, I I'm I'm so grateful for having had the privilege of having lived in a lot of different places because I feel like what that did is it really allowed me to learn and assimilate to a lot of different perspectives and ways of thinking and ways of problem solving and um, you know ways of interacting with the world and um, and thinking about the rest of the world boy is that you know try not living in the United States and and learning how other people think about the rest of the world it's it's you know so I think having some different perspectives ha has maybe shaped the way that I approach, my own kinds of problem solving, or even the people that I like to work with. I find that I am definitely drawn to and love working with people who are also pretty open-minded, <laughs> yeah. you know? So I am not in a super direct way. I wish I had some cool answer for that. Like I incorporate Aboriginal <laughs> in time mysticism into, and I mean, I just don't, but I think, you know, it's influenced me in the same way that I think all of your growing experiences do, you know, and in, in the ways that the people that you know shape you. And I, I think for me, I'm just very lucky that that background is pretty diverse. Thank you. And I think this this next question aligns with it um, a little bit. So I'm going to skip ahead a bit because I always you know, I send the questions beforehand. Professional. <laughs> Yeah, I read that you have like a deep love for all things retro. And mm -hmm. look, there was a period, you know, that I keep kind of playing with um, retro, like, you know, you start thinking about the 80s, the 80s is like 40 years ago. And I'm like, man, I could just do my whole lifestyle as like a cyberpunk and just do that. <laughs> I just think about it. Right. And so sort of this, this predilection to, towards um, all things retro, how does that show up and influence your work? And are there specific areas or, or styles that you, you keep coming back? Like, you see something that's a retro font, for instance, or something that is a, a technique or even a, a color palette, you know, like, yeah, that's from a certain era. That's from the 50s. That's from the 60s. That's from the 80s, what have you. So so speak on that a bit, because that really stuck out. Because I was just like, all right, sister. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, first of all, I got to say, I don't know why you had to say that the 80s was 40 years ago. That kind of sucks that you said that. <laughs> well, <laughs> so I try not to think about that. I was born in the 80s. Um but no, uh, I so yeah, I, I think that um, there's a few um, periods of time where stylistically, and I, I mean, I don't think this this doesn't come from anything deeper. It's just like we all have our our vibes that we gravitate to, right? And for me, there's a few different chunks that show up in my work a lot. If we go way back, I really love Art Nouveau, so I I tend to really love working with big flowing shapes, and I think that that kind of follows through. Um, I really love Art Deco, which you know was kind of more like you know 20s but i i love um just kind of the the bold geometry of it um but then i feel like that all kind of marries together for me i see a lot of art nouveau and art deco showing up later in like the 60s and the 70s which is like that is like that is that is the era that has my heart visually <laughs> um i don't know if you can see some of my like my palette and my stripes behind me um yeah, I, I, um, I love, I just love the vibe. I love the music. You you talked about font, which I love because I work with lettering a whole lot. I don't know, something about the big juicy shapes. And um, so I, I love like retro stripe motifs. What I'm doing right or where I'm, where I'm at right now is I love painting big retro stripes. I got to do a restaurant that was just all these big retro stripes and it was a dream job. But as a muralist, I'm like, you can only paint big stripes so many places for so many people. So what I'm trying to do right now is figure out a way to kind of take these color palettes and these shapes and these kind of, um, I don't know, some of the aesthetic and and do something a little bit more with it that can be a little more diverse. <laughs> 
Yeah, because a lot of times we we are our experiences, whether it be I, I, I do this, right? I, I I find like sometimes stuff that is more recent, you know, it, it inserts your, itself into your process, whether it's for me writing questions or internet uh, interview styles or even like maybe how I write something or even sort of what graphic it is and, and, and so on that I'm going to do with what I'm putting out. So I find like, all right, what error am I looking for? And mm-hmm. I'll go into like Google and it's like, just give me this time frame. I only want to yeah. look at stuff from that or even some of the, because I've gotten into decks or what have you a bit more and looking at older design just to mm-hmm. get inspiration from it. Because in, 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 in a part, like while some of this stuff is cool contemporarily, but, you know, when I go back in the past, it's like, that's what I'm looking for. That's that's what I care about. And I'll even look at maybe older interviews and, mm-hmm. you know, listening to older like like books just to get some illumination from that because at a point we just kind of get watered down by like sort of the same references but mm-hmm. if you go back you're able to get maybe some sense of truth and something that hey this hasn't really been touched as much so let me put my pastiche on this versus yeah. taking someone else's yeah no i i i totally agree and i feel like um what you were saying there about going you know like going back on google or whatever every single time i design it starts with like a massive pinterest board or just or like google image search of like you know and and i go down a rabbit hole with it but like for me i always start by just like absolutely like like letting myself become swallowed in like you know whether it's um messaging or you know uh, something very specifically visual but i i love that i totally totally do that too. And yeah, trying to like kind of, and then, and sort of parse out like, what is it that I'm seeing that's common among all these images or all of these ideas that I want to pull from and kind of make my own. I dig that. And so the other side of this or the part B to this question is, you know, I I was kind of slagging it there a bit, but is there like a, a trend that's like really, really like super new that you know, has inserted itself into how you approach your work or that shows up in your work that you're like, all right, this is, I can use this. Oh, see, that's a tough one. I think that um, as far as like something that is trending in the art world right now, I'm not... I'm not super in touch with whatever those things might be. Like I kind of do what I do and I know what I'm surrounded by, which is very local. And I feel like my entire life is very, you know, like I'm not, I'm not super on the pulse of like the, the, the big art scene with a capital A, but, um, but I know where I try to like the things that kind of are catching my attention at the moment. And um, I mean, it kind of goes back to what I was saying before. I think right now I'm trying to find a way to sort of marry a lot of these aesthetics together and and kind of swirl them around and um and put them into something new like I it's very random but I recently redid my bathroom and I came up with a design that I could repeat and it became kind of a repeating pattern and I was like oh maybe I want to do wallpaper so I like got all these tiny little mini canvases and started just coming up with all of these designs that could repeat and um Yeah. And I think, and what my goal was with that was to try to take little bits and pieces of these images, like going back to like retro stripes, for example, it's the kind of thing it's like, you can only do so many big, bold stripes, but what do you do if you take some of those stripes and you superimpose kind of a more art nouveau flower into it and then make it repeat. So um, I think that I, I definitely tend to get caught up in the visuals that I like. And um, I'll do that thing where like, um, I was listening to a podcast of yours earlier with somebody, and I don't remember who it was, but they were talking about how when they make art, they um, can listen to a song over and over and over and over again. And um, and I was like, in the same kind of way, I'll find myself taking um, a motif or a shape and just wanting to like play with it again and again and sort of recycle it through as many different filters as I can or, or as many different like um, applications as I can. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, you know, it's... It's it's one of those things like uh, I was touching on, I think, before we got started, sort of the kind of the, the curation, if you will. It's like, eh, I kind of know what I like and yeah. I know what catches my interest. And I know sort of even in doing this, like doing these interviews, who do I want to talk to and why do I want to talk to them? Just like I keep seeing this person's name pop up. I keep mm-hmm. seeing this person's work. Mm-hmm. What do they have to say? What is their work about giving me a, a sort of stronger understanding of it? And just like I approach 
what I do in a certain way, it's not that there's no room for like further development, but it's like, I'm curious about what I'm curious about, I guess. Yeah. 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 Right. Don't force it. Right. If, if your brain, if your eye, if you know, whatever it is, if that instinct inside of you wants to just really indulge in a particular idea or a particular visual, like don't fight it. Love it. So I read on your website that one of your goals is transforming space through contextual art. Can you speak a bit on sort of, you know, more on this motivation? I'll give you this context, right? Sure. I'm in, in a studio space. You can't see it because I'm not going to take off my green screen currently, but it's just like all of my creative stuff. I'm in my, my, my production studio. All of my creative stuff is in here. I have like a wall filled with Ninja Turtles action figures. It's great. But all the walls are white and they look terrible. That This is my studio setup. And I was like, <laughs> there's no art conversations actually happening in here. This is a padded cell with paintings on the walls. So oh I need we gotta to get in there. Let's get in there. Let's do something with this studio. I'm ready. So, well, that would be welcome. So <laughs> talk, talk a bit about sort of transforming space and sort of the importance of that. Why that, why is that an aim? Yeah, well, I think that um, for me, why that's important personally is um, when I, when I first started making art, which was a very recent thing for me, I started making art in 2020 when the world stopped you know, and so, I mean, this is not, it's not like I, you know, I didn't go to art school. I didn't grow up being like the kid in my family that everyone was like, Kate's going to be an artist. Um, it was, it's pretty recent for me, but I found that it was something that I really loved doing. But once, you know, life started happening again, and it was like a thing that I'd started doing that I loved that I didn't want to stop doing. It was, um, I found that I had a really hard time. I am just not the kind of artist who's going to have a sketchbook that I carry around with me all the time and doodle in. I am that I I have found that the way that I love making art is art that kind of has I mean I call it context but has purpose, has design, it has a, an aim to kind of accomplish something. Um and I don't think that there's any inherent virtue in that. It is just the way that I find myself drawn to making art. Like if I sit down with a canvas in front of me, I panic. I don't know what to do with it. Honestly, I, I don't, I'll sit there for an hour staring at it, not doing anything. And I'll end up cleaning my entire studio to avoid doing anything with this canvas. But if you give me a space and you say, this is how I want this space to feel, or, um, or, you know, we want to make it so that the flow of traffic kind of generally wants to move in this direction or, you know, whatever the goal is, mm -hmm. I find that then I start having tons of ideas and I have lots of inspiration. And um, I think one of the other questions that we're going to talk about later is collaboration, but this really feeds into it for me. I love working with parameters and whether that's other people's visions or goals or, you know, any other kind of purpose behind it. Um, I am super motivated artistically when there is purpose and context. So I love working with space. I always say that if I, if I wasn't an artist and, you know, time and money were no object, I would love to be an architect because I love, I love working um, in like sort of an immersive environment. I love when you're somewhere and you feel away just by standing there. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I don't know if that answers the question, but for me, I feel like doing murals is it's less about it's almost less about making the art and it's more about affecting the space yeah. for me my artistic motivation <laughs> so and, and that's a and that's a good distinction that kind of serves as a almost hand-fisted segue into this this next question around mm -hmm. sort of murals in public art macroly as far as folks mm -hmm. that like are visiting and even folks that are living here. I mean, let's face it, we 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 love beautiful things. I was like, man, put something ugly. I was like, no, no, put something great. Mm -hmm. And you know, me personally, right? I love the color gray. That's like one of my favorite colors. Um, but also I love burgundy as I feel like we and you you share, yeah. right? Yeah. So speak on that as far as like beautifying sort of like spaces, like outwardly. I just want to get some insight, you know, on that because I, I had this interview years ago, I believe, with Molly Ricks from uh, Baltimore Heritage. We were talking about sort of the gentrification gray, you know what I mean? And it's like, mm -hmm. all right, can we get some color at least in some of these spaces? And like around the, the corner where I'm at, I'm in East Baltimore and my old elementary school, abandoned, blighted, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, so artist did a huge mural on one of like the walls. And I was like, oh man, I hope they do something with that place versus it just being something in the background. So mm -hmm. Kind of 
speak on that from the mindset of seeing something that looks cool, seeing something that looks beautiful in and around the space we're in from the residents' perspective and even what your thoughts on maybe on someone visiting Baltimore? Yeah. Um, well, I think that murals specifically, but any kind of public art, really, I think that it's I think that the cool thing about it is that it's kind of accomplishing a lot of things at the same time. I think that, you know, and the, the obvious answer to this question is when you talk about community centered art and how art can impact a community. Right. And I know you've talked to Jazz and she does a lot of work here. And I feel like she's definitely been my segue into learning more about community art and why it's so important. Um, and I've only done a handful of truly community collaborative art pieces, but when you have a community and whether that is a neighborhood, a school, you know, whatever that can, however you might define that community. Um, when you, art is a really good way of, in a very obvious way, allowing that community to say something about itself, mm -hmm. right? And, and to do it in a way that beautifies but also makes them feel like they've taken some ownership and 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 it's like it's almost like a visual way of giving a voice to where you live and yeah. um, and people really take i mean like so the waverly commons mural that you mentioned earlier when we did that project we spent we did a few different we did a few different community engagement you know kind of we we did that in a few different ways, but um, one of the ways that was my favorite was just sort of canvassing. We wandered around. There's a whole community. There's a group of people that just hangs out right there in that square. And we went and we hung out with them. And so not only was it cool to get their ideas about what they might want this mural to be, right? Because this is theirs. They're going to be seeing this every day. I might go to the farmer's market every weekend, but they're the ones who are seeing it every single day. This is their square. And and it's and it belongs to the people who live in that neighborhood. And we wandered and we talked to people and asked what they want and what they want to see. And so not only was that really, I think, helpful to and for them that they felt heard and that it mattered that, you know, what what they, you know, are going to have put on their walls. But also it was the coolest thing, that group of people that sat there, they like they they became like our babysitters. Like they looked after us. They brought us food and water. If we needed to walk away with all of our supplies sitting right there in the open because we had to run to the bathroom or get some food, like we didn't worry for one second about leaving all of our equipment sitting there because they were looking after it. And it was because they had ownership. They had ownership of this. You know, they felt like they were a part of it. And now I really hope that every day that they're sitting there, they feel like that's their mural and that they had something to do with it. And it gives them a sense of pride in their community. And it also gives them a way to express to anybody else coming through, like, this is who we are, you know? Um, but also, <laughs> sorry, I'm a talker. Um, but also, um, I think, I think what's cool in terms of the, the perspective of like people coming into Baltimore and seeing Baltimore is that art is culture right and i think i mean i've been to cities where there's not so many murals and i even before i was a muralist you notice it right away when there is tons of public art and i think what that does is it tells you that there's culture here right and the, and that and that the culture is rich and like baltimore doesn't just have art we've got amazing food we've got amazing music and i think that when you get that immediate visual of like art is here, it kind of tells you that this is a place that there's more to, you know, that there's a lot to learn about and that there's a lot of culture to be experienced. No, that's, that's important. That's a, that's a good distinction. Like when I go to different cities and I, I was sharing with you the Wanderlust, the Aquarian Wanderlust, mm -hmm. I'm I'm looking for it. I'm I'm looking for like, all right, what's the street art look like? What's the public art sort of who's sponsoring the public art or what have you? It's like, oh, Verizon, I don't know. Or, or <laughs> not necessarily just the bag on them, but whatever the corporate sort of thing is. And, you know, there are times where even in and around Baltimore, I'll, I'll see just certain things that's like, all right, you put something up, but it's a little slapdash or who was involved in this. And I'm happy to see it up, but I wish maybe a little bit more attention to detail was was there because feeling that that sense of ownership, like, mm -hmm. you know, when I go through certain art districts, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm thinking of one in specific one particularly that, mm -hmm. you know, it's like if I'm seeing something out there, I wanted to feel like, all right, this is good. Not just like, who's the artist on this one? You know, yeah. because I've interviewed so many of them, you can tell whose work is what. Right. And 
you know, there's another, you know, there's other art in that area, that same area that I'm thinking of that's really good. And you see more recent art, it's like, all right, that's not, that's not finished. That's, yeah, <laughs> or it doesn't feel representative of, of the place that you're in, right? You can drive through a neighborhood and you can see two murals and you can tell which one had some kind of input input from the people who live there and, and which ones were done by somebody who like came in, saw a wall and did their own thing. It becomes about the artist rather than about the art reflecting the community. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a really good point. I, and I love the you're, you're sharing sort of the canvassing piece, I, I think you know, coming from sort of the the day job, the, the corporate life, whenever there's a a new manager, a new leader coming in for sake of argument, I think mm -hmm. the ones that do the successful thing is they canvas, get a sense of the lay of the land versus coming in like Reggie Hammond and saying like, yo, I'm the new sheriff in town. I'm taking this whole thing over. It's just like, no, canvas, get a sense of what is, what is, and then sort of build off of that. That's really important. Right. It's humbling yourself. And I've had that exact experience on both sides. I have worked jobs where, you know, like somebody new comes in and like, you know, and they want to they want to make all these rules, but they don't understand the processes. But so I, and I've also been at the other end. I've started in in leadership positions um, at jobs and like and it is not only is it a, a better way to ingratiate yourself to the people that you're going to be spending time with, but you just do so much of a better job when you humble yourself and you take a moment and you go, okay, I don't actually know anything. And I mean, in a work environment, that's one thing, but it's the same thing when you're, when you're painting, you come into a neighborhood and you're like, I don't know this neighborhood. We did that at Waverly. We walked in and we were like, we, you know, Caroline lives in Pigtown. I'm in Butcher's Hill. It's like, we're, we don't know Waverly aside from the few times that we come in to go to Ace Hardware or go to the farmer's market. So like, you tell us what your neighborhood is, right? Because this is your mural. <laughs> yeah. And Butcher's Hill, that, that's, that's, that's my neck of the woods, by the way. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, Wait, where are you butcher still too? Um a little little further, a little further east, but uh, okay. a, little, a little further west rather. Um, uh, but I go through Patterson Park every morning. So I'm I'm a couple blocks away. I love Patterson. Yeah. Patterson Park is my heart. <laughs> so you're involved in commercial, residential, and community, mm -hmm. right? And um, how do you sort of balance the the needs of a project with your own creative desires? Um I've come into that a few different times, more recent that it's been a lot more often than I'm expecting where, you know, I may have a client that's like, hey, can you, you know, do this pod for us and so on. And I I often say no, because yeah. it's like we have like competing visions and it's like, this has to be interesting to me. Sure. And sometimes it's like, maybe I'm not the right person for it. Not necessarily saying this idea sucks, but maybe I'm not the right person for, you know what I do, right? You know, right. So how do, or, or, or what considerations are you making when you have something that may feel like it's a, it's a project or a collaboration, but it's like, what are you like aiming for it to maybe stretch the boundaries of what you do creatively, or maybe try out a new technique. So speak on that a bit. Yeah. Um, well, so in the in the mural slash signage world, I feel like there's a there's a few different kinds of murals or signage that people do. There's the corporate stuff, and you mentioned that. And the answer to your question is there's no creative freedom there, really. I mean, only in as much as you might have your own process and have some wiggle room for, you know, how like the logistics for how you want to install or, you know, like asking for a certain kind of aerial lift equipment over others. But mm -hmm. but really, I mean, there's when it comes to the corporate stuff, often what you are doing is either straight up signage and you're being given the font and you're being given the dimensions and all of that, or it's, you know, like a big developer and then a design firm like Yance or something has done the design. So then you're just executing it. Yeah. Um, and for a job like that, and like you said, there's sometimes that, you know, you get, you get requests and you just say, that's not me. And that a lot of artists do that. Um, I actually kind of like it. For me, that's a kind of um, work that it requires so much less thinking. Um, so, I mean, I, I do a little bit of everything, but not all muralists do. Um, so there's those. And and for those ones, it's like the tension might be there. It might not. Doesn't matter. They're, you, like you're doing what you're being, you know, given to do. Um, where that comes into play a little bit more is with stuff like the, I mean, community murals, because again, like, you know, we just had that whole conversation about wanting to represent a community, but also, you know, if you're the artist coming in to do a thing, you want to put a little bit of voice into it. And, you know, you've got your, your way of painting a thing, you know, like I'm always going to look like my work, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, I think, but that's where, um, you know, that's where I think you, you try to understand the, 
the community well enough that you can find something that you can really relate to and connect to and get really excited about. Um, and it's the same kind of thing for the third kind of mural, which is more of a smaller client, small business kind of thing where, um, I mean, and that's what I do a lot of. I do a lot with small businesses, restaurants, hair salons, that kind of thing. Small business clients are kind of my favorite um, because they really do. They hit right on that tension, right, of like somebody else's requirements and parameters, but then also wanting to kind of express your creative voice and vision. And um, and I know a lot of artists get frustrated by that. But again, I find that that is I work best with parameters. So mm -hmm. it's like, tell me, you know, maybe tell me what the purpose is. Tell me what the feel you want is. And then I'm going to come up with lots of ideas based on that. Um, so I don't know. But I also I think that I'm not at this point yet, but I hope to one day be at a point where I'm successful enough that I can kind of choose the clients that I'm working with in a way that, you know, I can work with. Cause like, there's some clients that I've worked with that it's like, we don't even need to like talk about it. Our vision's just a line. Right. Um, and there's, you know, uh, Jesse Sandlin who, you know, I think you've talked to her, haven't you? Um, yep. and I've done some work for Jesse and it's like, like, I don't know. I like, I just know what she likes. She knows what I'm going to do. And like she, and we just trust each other. And like, so she's an amazing client to work with. And I, I would love to work with more Jessies, you know, um, where that tension just doesn't even really exist because you're just aligned from the, from the beginning anyway. Yeah. I, and and, I, and I'll say, and thank you for that, because I'll say, like, you know, before I move into this next question, I'll say, like, in, in one uh, client relationship that I was very, like, you know, at my wit's end of sort of, I'm a, I'm a relatively patient person. I'm told I'm very patient. I don't think I am. I'm like, look, I'm burning up inside. But uh, it's it's one of these things where, you know, I, I went there with, like, minimal detail as to what I'm doing. And my thing is I shift from being, hey, I'm just going to create and just everything is open, you know, that's everything and, you know, kind of looking for those parameters, but oh. not getting them because oh. I think the person running it is kind of from an artist perspective, they're like, you're a subject matter expert. So whatever it is that you need to do, I'm gonna let you cook. And once I have that, once I have that sort of realization of, oh, you're letting me cook. Cool. Right. Got you. But, you know, going in initially, especially when it's sort of like, that, that sort of intersection of this is business and that it's a contract involved. And so I'm being a professional creator or professional artist, but right. it's just like, Hey, just go ahead and cook. If you told me that, then it's like, I got magic for you. I got gold for you. Right. Do the, the sort of corporate -y thing. And I've done that. I've done ghost podcasts in the past and I find mm -hmm. people don't know what the hell they want. But yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> but once sure. we get to that that point where it's just like, no, we just want you and to do what you do, and then we're gonna pay you for it or we're gonna offer you this for it, then that's a sort of different conversation. And I think it aligns with what you were describing, like getting to that stage and that or success or what have you, that okay, I'm I can hand pick who I want to come on. And it's right. even doing it with, with these interviews at times, oh. there are some times where I'll, I'll have a guest on and it's, 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 it's just, it, it's not there. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, and that, that doesn't happen a lot, maybe 5% of the time, but the rest of it generally it clicks, you know, and that's, that's the way it goes. And I kind of look at this as almost that, that client sort of relationship. I look at this as more collaborative than anything else. We're dance partners right now. Sure. Sure. Yeah, no, and it can be really hard to get to that point. I actually find that to be the most difficult part of the process is when you're working with a client who at the start really doesn't know what they want, right? It's kind of that, like, you're both sort of living in that ambiguity. And it takes a lot of work to figure out, to, like, to find the thread. Um, and, you know, sometimes you don't. Like, sometimes you sometimes you don't find that thread. And, and sometimes you do, and it's like, well, this is kind of more their thread than my thread. <laughs> but, you know, it's like, you know, but I'm I'm going to take the job, so I'm going to do what I need to do. But um, it is always like there. It's amazing and kind of magical when you get that moment of spark where it's like, OK, you, you came up with the idea. You're both on the same page. And like and now they're just like then then the trust is there, too. And it's like then you can just be excited about what happens next. I love it. So I got two more real questions I want to hit you with. And mm -hmm. uh, the first one goes this way. So recently, you know, you've touched on it. Um, you know, I've interviewed uh, Saba, interviewed Jazz and um, from uh, Brush Mural Fest. And I learned about sort of the community of muralists and some of the program and education opportunities, mentorship, 
great, great stuff. Mm -hmm. So could you could you speak on sort of the role that the Baltimore arts community from a collaborative standpoint, you, you touched on, you know, sort yeah. of your relationship with jazz. So what about Baltimore do you think makes it a unique place for artists from from your perspective? Ugh. Well, two of the answers are uh, jazz and Saba. <laughs> um, no, I was, I, I was, and I don't even think that I realized how fortunate I was at the time, but coming into the mural specifically, the mural scene in Baltimore when I did, I, I, I used to say it was the easiest thing ever. Baltimore made it, you know, like, boy, the Baltimore scene, like anybody can just bust into it because all of the artists here just want to reach out and like help you and support you and give you resources. And that was very much my experience. I did a project very early on that was kind of a public art project, but it was how I met, um, I met Mowgli, I met Jazz through it. I met a few, uh, uh, Jess from White Coffee Creative. I, I met a few artists in the city and I think, um, I think that, I think that both things are true. I think that it is true that um, that Baltimore, I think because, you know, we've got Micah here, but also Baltimore is just, I mean, we're not DC, we're not New York. It's a smaller city, there's less money here. And I think because of that, I think resources kind of just need to be pooled, right? Like if any of us are gonna be successful, we kind of need to count on each other and rely on each other um, to be able to do that. But I also think that I got very, very lucky in finding the few people that I did um, early on. Um, Jazz was huge. Um, she very much introduced me to most of the other muralists that I would come to know um, and then build relationships with. And kind of it was really the seed of kind of uh, the community that I've that I've, you know, got now in the art, art community in Baltimore. Um, but I mean, I for me, it really goes back to. Um, I mean, a lot of muralists start out by assisting, right? So you're being brought on to help another artist. But I mean, really almost without fail, every artist that I have met and worked with in Baltimore has just been so willing to share. And whether that's sharing sharing concepts, sharing ideas, like intellectual property, there's like, the, like the, people just are giving that away right now in the art scene in Baltimore, right? Like, I mean, I, I've gotten so much advice and been asked for absolutely nothing in return. Um, but equipment, jobs, the number of jobs that I got early on that were just handed off by other muralists who couldn't do the work at the time, right? Um, so, I mean, I... I, it's possible that there's other cities out there where there is the same sense of collaboration as there is in Baltimore, but I suspect that it is rare. And I suspect that it is because of people like Jazz and Saba and Jess starting things like Brush. I think right now um, there is a contingent of, of muralists specifically, but artists in Baltimore who are just really invested in making this scene one that is... Um, that is collaborative and like easier for the people who come after us, right? Like instead of that attitude of well, it was hard for me, it's going to be hard for the next guy, like being like, no, it doesn't have to be like that. We can like, there's enough work to go around. Just the point being that I feel like, um, I, I feel like it is because of some, it is because of this contingent of artists in Baltimore right now that are working really hard to perpetuate this environment and, and it's working. And I think that the more, um, warm and, and welcoming and open you are to helping anybody else around you come up. It, I feel like that, that intention spreads, right? And because I had so many artists so willing to help me when I was first starting, I mean, I feel so, I, I mean, like I've gained and, 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 um, benefited from that so much that I absolutely will do whatever I can for, you know, like the next muralist who asks me for some advice or to borrow a paintbrush, you know, it's like, yeah, sure. It's paying it forward. And, you know, that's, that's important. I think community is, it's, it's so key. And, you know, I've, for two thirds of this podcast journey, I don't like the word journey. It's gotten real, <laughs> but for, for this time in which I've been a podcaster, I think two thirds of it, you know, just out of the nature of what it was, I was kind of like learning on my own. And mm -hmm. now in sort of this most recent year or so, you know, always having this desire because it's, for me, it's always like, what does the most good? So for someone that's actually trying to get into it, and in a real way, it's, it's some vetting that goes on there, but I'm not like, hey, you got to charge me as a, cons you know, you got to pay me as a consultant to come on and help you with your thing. You know, I always have this belief that 
you know, universe, community, whatever it is, I'm, I'm going to be good. I'm going to be looked out for in mm-hmm. that regard. But also my thing is to help someone, you know, whether it's loaning out equipment, podcast equipment is not cheap or just sharing like ideas or even serving as a producer for someone to just help them get the rhythm and the flow of things. You know, that's what it's been for me. And I've seen other people who maybe have what we would deem as more success Mm. You know, as far as the public faces, you know, it's like I say, dudes in suits don't really have taste. Uh, you know, those are the ones who need to sort of be the top dog and burn a bridge behind them. And I'd rather rebuild that bridge or at least say, all right, that's another bridge we're going to make. I don't know when, but we're making another one. That's that's more right. of my my approach. Yeah, well, and I think that, I mean... You make a good point. I mean, it, but it's it's like it's the concept of the paying it forward, but it's not even just as altruistic as that, right? Because it's like when it's a reciprocal thing, right? You're not just you're not just paying it forward for the next guy and getting no, nothing from it because the next guy is going to come up then and they're going to be doing some big stuff and they're going to have projects they can't handle and pass them back off to you, right? So it's not just you know, so selfless, which I mean, it is a little bit, but it, it's also just creating the kind of environment that you want to continue to work in. Yeah, that's that's, that's, a, that's a good point. It's a really good point. I, I think it's it's relationships at the end of the day. And, mm-hmm. you know, I and I find like not everyone gets that. But when you run into folks who do get it, that's important. That's why that sort of thriving environment works. Um, so that's that's great. You know, we're not a big fan of the I got mine. So you got to get yours. I, we're not a big fan of that. You know, it's just like help folks along. All right. So this is the last one that I'm, I'm curious about. And I think for for many listeners, um, even maybe your humble host, I'm curious uh, when you made sort of that that full pivot you know, from into like full time, like art, what were some of the the biggest like challenges you faced? And, you know, how did you like push along? What was like that number one challenge that was there? Um, I've had several folks on this podcast who will say like, yeah, I'm full time now. Like I'm not mm-hmm. doing, sort of splitting the time. And, you know, right. as I shared with you before we got started, right. I'm a new walker living both lives. I don't know how it's happening, but so for you, what was that point and sort of how did you kind of get past that the challenge? Well, I I was very lucky to not have the same challenges that I think a lot of other artists do when transitioning from, you know, either the the, you know, the W2 day job into like their own, you know, their own thing full time or, or, you know, kind of like trying to ease, you know, from like, you know, the, the, the side gigs and then slowly shuffle into it, which I think for a lot of people, the big um, stopping point there and pain point there is financial, right? Um, I have a partner who right around the time that I was kind of making that decision to move into doing art some amount, yeah. professionally, um, was just graduating from school and, you know, had a job lined up that, you know, it was going to make it so that I didn't have to worry about, you know, can I pay the mortgage this month if I'm not working my full day job full time anymore. So I was very, very lucky that for me, um, the, the financial aspect was not really a big challenge, which I think that it probably is for a lot of artists or people, you know, creatives moving into, you know, self-employment. Um, for me, I think that, um, the biggest challenge was the biggest challenge was real. I mean, I think it was kind of twofold. I think, I think logistically the biggest challenge was just trying to build that client base because it's like, you know, even if you aren't like, (laughs) it's such a hard ball to get rolling, right? Because you kind of need, and it's, it's what I think jazz and Saba are kind of trying to counter a little bit with things like the brush mural festival, but it's, you know, until you have a portfolio of work, you don't have anything to show potential clients. And also who are those potential clients? Where are they coming from? So, you know, for me, that was accomplished through doing a lot of assisting. And, and like I mentioned before, I was very lucky to have enough jobs handed off that that kind of build a client base and, you know, kind of build a contact list and all of that. Um, So that, I mean, but that is like, even with all the resources at your disposal, like that is just getting people to trust you and having done your work for long enough that you can show to people like, hey, this is a thing that I can actually do, not just say that I can do. Um, So I think that's, there's no shortcuts 
you know, for that, like that just takes time and it just takes kind of like putting your head down <laughs> and, and doing it as best as you can. Um, but the other thing for me is, um, was very much the imposter syndrome, which I know I already talked about it's, I suffer from it, uh, all the time, but, um, just, I think kind of trying to convince a client that I can come paint something on their wall and then sitting at home and going, can I paint that on their wall? Can I do that? I had a moment. So one of the very first real professional jobs that I had was um, for a business that it's so sad. It doesn't exist anymore, but it was like a tiki drink place down in Canton. And um oh. Yeah, Mr. Nice Guys, I miss, yeah. I, I miss it so much. But um, that was one of my first real, real gigs. And um, like, and not just not just one that got handed to me. It was like, you know, the client knew me through a person, through my work. And so I was really excited about it. And we talked about this concept and I mocked it all up digitally. And then, and, you know, I practiced a little at home just to make sure that, you know, to figure out how I wanted to paint some of this stuff. But I remember walking in that day, that first day of work and staring at the wall and like being... I mean, I would never have admitted this to anybody, but I was mortified. I was, I had this moment of being like, can I even paint a plant? Do I even know how to do this? I've been doing this for like a year. Like I painted a bunch of flowers and like, I think I can do it. And obviously I thought I could do it enough that I like got this gig, but like, can I actually do this? And you know, like two days later, there was a mural on the wall that I was very proud of. And like, you know, it happened, but the imposter syndrome is really hard to push through and you know it's hard to um like you need to believe that you can do something in order to convince other people that you can do it and when you know when that isn't very well bolstered in your core it can be you know it's a, it's a hard it's a hard hurdle and i found that it was i i needed to kind of almost like fake it till i made it to myself <laughs> yeah um, in order to be able to be successful and uh, and do the things that it turned out I could do. I just wasn't convinced I could do them, you know? I hear you. And, you know, uh, last comment I'll make on that before I move into the rapid fire um, questions. Yeah, I, I run into that on occasion and doing all of these. And I just, just remind myself of like, yeah, it's fine. No one's going to know, you know, yeah. it's sort of yeah. that. Or even this this notion of, I think, in doing all of these things, certain things are transferable, certain things are not. So I'll get like opportunities to MC something. I'm like, I'm that's a different, that's a slightly different skill set. Or it's like, oh, be charismatic. It's like that's not really what I do. Let's uh, just be charismatic. Yeah, it's just like ah, I'm boring. Um, but it, it's it's one of those things where I think when I have too much time you know, mm -hmm. like lead time leading up to the, the yeah. sort of thing, that's when all of the naysayer stuff starts popping up and mm -hmm. that, that syndrome starts to sit in. But it's not like, hey, just go up there and do it now. It's like, I need a little bit, but I don't need, let's say, let's say if this, if you're like, hey, I got this interview coming up three weeks from now, I'm like, ooh. But if it's like, I got this interview coming up three hours from now, mm -hmm. I don't really have the time to overthink it. Yeah. Time mm -hmm. for that anticipation and letting that imposter syndrome set in, settle in. But um, three weeks, or I remember when I did um, the creative mornings, and mm -hmm. you know, you get a month and change, five weeks, something like that. And I was like, oh, this is, I'm going to, I'm going to spontaneously combust on stage. This is way too much time to sit around and be nervous about this thing. <laughs> right. It's like, oh, just talk about yourself. I was like, I don't know who I am. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think, um, yeah. Once you're able to get through, get past the hurdles and sort of just, just see like, yeah, I'm going to be successful at this. I'm going to be good at this. And just almost reminding yourself that you get past it and then you just move to the next thing. It's about getting those reps in at times and uh -huh. just reminding yourself that I, I, I can do this. I, I've already done this. Here's proof that shows that I can do this and I've done this. Right. Like give, like give yourself space for that thought and then turn yeah. your brain off. So you don't think about any of the other stuff. <laughs> 120 percent um <clears throat> so that's sort of it for the real questions okay now i got mm, three three and a half rapid fire questions i know okay. it's a half question in there somewhere but um as i tell folks all the time don't overthink these okay all right so i'm gonna save the more uh, art centric one for last i think it's funny um what is your all-time favorite retro item Flux capacitor. What do you got? Oh my God. I have 
Um, so it's not an authentically retro item, but it looks very retro. Okay. <laughs> um, but I have this, um, this it's, it is a, like, it's not even burgundy. It's like, you know, oxblood, like it is just so deep and rich that it's like, it's like, we like, we've passed beyond red at this point. And it's this like velvet duster. Nice. Nice. And I'm like this, it, it is, it is my favorite. It's probably my favorite thing I own. Yeah. Ox blood. I say that that is um, the, the blood of my enemies for one. Um, <laughs> I, I have a ox blood color suit that unfortunately I can't fit anymore. And oh, cool. um, my partner's living room is that color. So when I go, oh. I was like, oh, I'll be in the parlor. And she's just like, why do you have like a glass, like a coupe glass in your hand? What are you, a villain? It's like, always, <laughs> always. We got it. We got to get you back in that suit. <laughs> yeah. It's, and it's, it's got like the little faint pinstripes in it too. Oh. It's, Stop killing me. This is amazing. <laughs> I'm going to wear the duster. You're going to wear the suit. We're going to go out to uh, Bloom's. <laughs> I'm, here for it. I'm here for it. I love it. Uh, here's the next one. Um, the, you, you touched on this earlier, um, so I definitely wanted to dive in it a little bit. Um, what do you usually get from the farmer's market? Like, you know, I'm a farmer's market, like, goer, tender as well. And, you know, this is how I became aware of um, pie time, for instance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so what do you usually get from the farmer's market? Like if I encounter you and run into you there, what do you likely have on your person? So I am, I am going to apologize because I am so bad at remembering names of businesses. I can describe them. So almost every time I go, there's the one stall that has just everything vegan and my sister's vegan. So I yeah. always get something for her because it's always delicious. And I usually get something for me too. Um, Sometimes the empanadas are there, which are my jam. I love nice. me an empanada. But really, my two great loves are the, uh, like the, of course, it's going to be like the the vintage uh, bus, right? With all the cool yeah. clothes and jewelry. Like, of course, that's like, I love that. But then also the baked goods, the bakery. Like, I got to bring home the vegan food for my sister and the almond croissant for my partner. <laughs> I dig it. I dig it. Um, whenever I go out of town, like I was saying before we got started, I was in Columbus and it's like, I'm always bringing something back. And I have this running bit where I bring back coffee beans for my partner. Oh, okay. And it's that's, always yeah. something. And if it's somewhere that's local, I'm coming back with ridiculous like cookies. So I, I popped over briefly uh, yesterday to pie time and mm -hmm. I was just like, yo, Max, what you got? And he's like, I got some oatmeal cookies. They're new. I was like, I'm gonna get six of those. Yep. Box them up. Thanks. <laughs> And, you know, we we go to a movie last night to see Candyman. And I was like, yeah, so no popcorn, but I got cookies. A thousand times cookies over popcorn. That was the right choice. <laughs> okay, here's here's the last one. Here's the last one. Um, if you could pick any spot in Baltimore, doesn't matter. Money doesn't matter. Any of the red tape. If you can pick any spot for a mural, where would that spot in Baltimore be? Butcher's Hill, baby. It's it's my neighborhood and I haven't done a mural here and I'm desperate to. I want somebody to give me money to paint a mural here. Um, I was really, really lucky last winter. Um, I don't know. Uh, you said you spent time in Patterson Park, the observatory there. Um, there every uh, like holiday season and then through the winter, they, uh, there was an artist that was doing installations in the in the window there. And she, she passed the torch and last year it was passed to me. And um, they've asked me to do it again this holiday season, which I'm so excited about. Yeah. And it's the closest thing to like art in my neighborhood that I've been able to do so far. Aside from, that's not True. I painted a mural in my neighbor's backyard, but you can't see it from the street. I want something public in my neighborhood. And that is like totally prideful, but I just want to walk around and be like, this is where I live. And I get to see this thing that I painted all the time because like imposter syndrome, man, I kind of still can't believe that this is my job and that I do this. So I feel, I want that reminder, like outside my front door. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the motivations of me putting up a giant billboard in station North. I'm doing right. Okay. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you see me right there, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's that's really cool. Is that is that reminder? Is that verifiable? It's like, yeah, you just see my work. Yeah, it's literally right there. <laughs> right. Well, I think also too, it'll be like um, when I've proved that I've really made it because it's like, am I even really a muralist in Baltimore if I haven't even done work in my own neighborhood? So one day. You'll, you'll, you'll be there and, you know, hopefully, um, you know, it'll be sooner than later. Um, Maybe somebody listening to this podcast. <laughs> there, you there you go. I mean, there are a few people listening to this podcast. Uh, so that's kind of it 
for for the questions for today. Um, so one, I think we covered a lot of territory, a lot of good stuff here. And um, so one, I want to thank you for coming on and spending some time with me. And two, I want to invite and encourage you to share with the listeners um, where they can find you at, social media, website, all of that good stuff. The floor is yours. Thank you. Well, I want to say thank you so much for having me on. And I was so impressed by how insightful your questions were. When you sent me the list, I was like, how does this man know me so well already? We've never even talked yet. No, but I, this was so much fun. And I really appreciated how, how much time you took to really like get to know my work before we did this. So that was very cool. Um, but so my my business name is Kate K Designs LLC. Um, my website is Kate K Designs. It's K-A-I-T, not K-A-T-E for those who are just listening. Um, so Kate K Designs and then, you know, Instagram handle. KK Designs, it's pretty ubiquitous. If you look up KK Designs, you'll find me wherever you're going to find me. <laughs> and there you have it, folks. I want to again thank Kate Kluswitz for coming on to the podcast and sharing a bit of her story, connecting uh, purpose and context. And I am your host, Rob Lee, saying that there's art, culture, and community in and around your neck of the woods. You just have to look for it. Music.